Good morning. Two two Sundays off is one too many apparently because I'm nervous again. I hadn't felt this nervous in a while, but here we are. I want to thank Steve and Jared for filling in for me. I'm sure you all enjoyed hearing from somebody other than me for for a little bit. It's good it's good to hear a different voice every now and then. For those of you who do not know, I just got back from Animus, North Dakota. We hunted pheasants out there. We took a we took duck hunting stuff as well, but we never the guys I was with had bird dogs, so I don't think they were too interested in the ducks. So we we hunted pheasants the whole time, and I just kind of wanted to recap some of the trip for you. North Dakota, for those of you who are not geography experts, is far away from here. It's an yeah. We were 75 miles from the Canadian border. It was an 18-hour drive. I've been to this little town before, Animus, and uh, I've been on several mission trips that are far away. This North Dakota trip was far away. Of course, it wasn't a mission trip. It was just a recreation uh, time, but I'm finding that my whole life has become one great big mission trip. While we were in North Dakota, we spoke with several landowners. This is The reason you go to North Dakota is because one, it's far away and it's good to get away. But two, if the land in North Dakota is not posted by the landowner, you can hunt it. So if you ride by, everything's in sections. A section is one mile by one mile. So John Rowland will own a section, Sandy will own a section. And if John Rowland doesn't post his ground, you can get out of the truck and hunt right there. So that's the benefit of going to North Dakota. It's not like that here. We all know that. So we Every now and then we find a good place to go and it was posted. We go knock on somebody's door and one of these doors we knocked on, uh, the the family's names were Naomi and Randy Schnazzi. I think I'm saying that right. I don't know for sure, but we're going to pretend like I am. And they, my friends had made contact with these people a year. I think they went, they go on this trip every other year. So they've already made contact with the Schnazis. It's a hard, it's a hard one. I wish their last name was Smith, but it's not. So they had, they had, my friend Brian had been talking to Naomi for a while about when we were coming up there and all that. So um, they actually invited us to their home to eat dinner one night. So I think on two, we had spaghetti on Monday night at our house at the Airbnb or whatever. And then the next night, Naomi invited us over. Did I just get louder? Naomi invited us over and uh, we had spaghetti the second night as well. Of course, we didn't tell her that until uh, after the fact, but... So we were at their house, and North Dakota is di- much different than here. The population of North Dakota is 750,000, and there's a lot of land, and there's not a lot of people. So those people live sort of in isolation. The town we were in, the population, I think, is 217. So I don't know. I think the county is like 5,000. I don't know how big the county is. The point is you don't run into a whole lot of folks. You definitely don't run into a whole lot of outsiders. So it was, it was nice for them to invite us into their home. And um, we got to spend some time with them, and I got to pray before we ate. And her, their daughter was there. They have a few daughters. Uh, one of their daughters was there, and she cooked the meal. And part of my prayer was, Lord, thank you for giving them this time together, you know, because she, her daughter lives in Cleveland. And um, they were just getting to spend some special time together. And we found out while we were there, they had another daughter that died uh, just a few weeks ago of cancer. So they were it's a troubling time for their family. So I prayed before we ate and we ate and we had a good gospel conversation during the meal. And the very next day we found out from Randy, um, we were going to pheasant hunt on his property. We found out that Naomi ended up in the hospital. So in the amount of time we were there, she ends up in the hospital with low oxygen and long story short, she had to have a pacemaker put in and, uh, but we got to call and check in on her while we were there. So it's it's as if, yeah, we went there to hunt pheasants, but God had a plan also that we would get to spend time with a family that doesn't get a lot of interaction with other folks. They don't say that. That's just my observation. I don't know how it's possible because there's just not very many people there. So um, this was not a mission trip, but if you have your eyes open and your ears open, your whole life can sort of become a mission trip. If you see like, hey, these people are living sort of in isolation, and uh, maybe God has a plan in sending us there uh, that we could be a presence in their life just for a night to share a meal together. So that was exciting. You never know when you're going to be a guest in someone's house and can be an encouragement to people in a time of need. So I think I've already said this, but maybe God had us in Animus, North Dakota that week 
just to be in the presence of some people that needed a little extra presence in their life for a short time. You never know how God is going to use you in certain situations. Remember about a year ago, Miss Paula and I hopped on a plane and took off to another side of the world, which was even further away than North Dakota. We went to Australia. And when I say it's on the other side of the world, it is on the other side of the world. I didn't bring the globe up here. I could have shown you. You can look it up. I don't know where you can go on this earth that's any further away. I, there's probably a place, but I, there can't be many. We were with a group of 10 or 12 other people from our old church, and this was a mission trip. And we've gotten to witness some evident fruit from this trip. And it doesn't always happen this way, that we get to see the fruit of our labor as it relates to the kingdom of God here on earth. But sometimes God grants us the opportunity to see the fruit. While we were in Australia, we didn't see anyone saved. But this week, Pastor Steve, who is the great big tall guy that we were working with, uh, his wife sent, his wife's name is Linda, she sent Paula and I a video testimony from one of their three daughters. And I've got some pictures for you and a video for you here in a minute. But the three daughters' names were Leela, Katie, and Prisca. Do you all have those pictures? So that's Leela. That's Katie. And that's Prisca. And Leela was the oldest one who I got to go pig hunting with. I do a lot of hunting apparently. Um, but flip on over to the next picture. So that's Leela in the middle. We were with her dad, Steve. That is not Steve. That's my buddy Will. Steve is like six foot seven uh, Australian pastor man. And this is his daughter, Leela. And um, the other two daughters, Katie and Prisca, we were in the truck with Katie and Prisca for at least an hour, I guess, uh, the night. I guess that was probably the night we met Steve. And he just kind of took us around and showed us some things. And so we got to spend time with them. And um, I have a video. I'm going to get to a point here in a minute. I have a video that Katie's mom, Linda, sent us the other day. And I want to play it for you all just to kind of highlight how we got to be a part of a kingdom event while we were there. You probably have to listen very carefully to her accent. My life with Christ was difficult. I was Turn it up and start it over if you don't mind. Anxiety. Growing up in a Christian household, Christ was difficult. I was in. Growing up in a Christian household, Christ was difficult. I was in. Growing up in a Christian household, Christ was difficult. I was in. Growing up in a Christian household, Christ was I was surrounded by godly people and had a strong support system I could fall back on, but that wasn't enough. I needed to build a personal relationship with God. It wasn't until last September, when the Americans in Townsville Worship team came to Long Beach on their mission trip, that I felt I needed to devote my life to Jesus. They were running a worship night, and when I felt God with me that night, I decided I wanted Him with me for the rest of my life. After giving my life to Christ, Everything became easier. My anxiety disappeared practically overnight. I was no longer insecure and knew that I could tackle any challenge with Jesus by my side. I would like to recognize a couple of people, Miss Virtual, who has inspired me this year as I watched her grow on her faith, and Rebecca, who has always been there for me to talk to about my faith journey. The next step for me is to be baptized which God revealed it was time for in multiple different ways. It is time for me to make a public declaration, making it known that I will let God guide me through the rest of my life, which is what I'm doing today. So the point of me, that's hard to hear because of, the, because of where they are and her accent, September. I missed that accent. But she said, you might not have caught it, but she, said, she referenced the Americans. She said last September the Americans came and uh, the people from Townsville, which is just another place in Australia, we came to do this sort of retreat weekend and something happened inside her that weekend. She, she felt something in a different way. Of course, her, we weren't the ones that saved her, but we played a part in the process. Her, her dad is a pastor and her mom, uh, her, her parents point, her, point them to Jesus every day. But our presence there made some sort of impact on her. And you don't always get to see that. And it's exciting when you do. So I'm not saying that, uh, well, let me back up. God calls us to a mighty mission. He tells us to go to all the nations and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And I'm not saying that the Americans uh, were the difference makers in the lives of these three, in the lives of these three girls, because we weren't. 
Their dad is a pastor and uh, he and his wife point these girls to Christ on a daily basis, but we all have a part to play in the Great Commission. For Paula and I, our part included getting to go to Australia and meet this lovely family. And when we met, we were total strangers, but now we are brothers and sisters in Christ for all eternity. And since our trip to Australia, Leela, the oldest daughter, has been saved and baptized. Katie has been saved and baptized. That was Katie speaking there. And Prisca has been saved and is being baptized at their church service today. So that is exciting. Jesus invites us into relationship with Him. And when He does, He invites us into kingdom adventures. When I said yes to Jesus, I didn't realize that over an eight-year period, I would travel to Africa and Australia and sell my house and move to Bellevue. But here we are. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus invites a rich young man into relationship with him, but the rich young man chooses his God over Jesus. And I want to read about that in Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. But before I do that, I would like to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the Great Commission where you tell us to go to all the nations and make disciples. And Lord, we know that that starts at our own homes, in our own towns, in our own communities. We must make disciples exactly where we are. And when you tell us to go somewhere else, then we will willingly go to any place that you send us to make disciples. I pray that we learn a valuable lesson here today in the rich young man's neglect of your call on his life. I pray that um, we, we know and understand that when you invite us into a relationship with you, we ought to accept it. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 17, and as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Disheartened by this saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So this rich man, rich young man wanted to know what he had to do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus responded to him by quoting some of the Ten Commandments from the book of Exodus. Jesus says to the rich young man, you know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, and honor your father and mother. The rich young man responds by saying he is not guilty of breaking these commandments. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, but you lack one thing. Jesus knows. He knows where this man's emptiness is. He knows where where he lacks. He says you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And the man, so the man had broken the first commandment. If you go back to Exodus 20, chapter 3, or chapter 20, verse 3, God says to Moses, you shall have no other gods before me. So this rich young man wanted to inherit eternal life, but he wanted his money more. We know this to be true because the last verse of this passage says that the man was disheartened by the saying and he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. The Christian life is a life of sacrifice. We see sacrifice all throughout the Bible. The rich young man wanted the reward of the kingdom without the sacrifice that comes with it. Jesus tells us, just as he told the rich young man that to follow him, you must lay down the things of your life. You must take up your cross and follow him. Now, the rich young man seemed like a pretty good guy in the beginning. He says, I've not murdered. I've not committed adultery. I've not stolen and I've not falsely testified against anyone. I haven't defrauded anyone and I even honored my father and mother. The problem was he was unwilling to put Jesus before everything else. This rich young man worshipped his wealth and his money as his God and was unwilling to walk away from it to follow Jesus. (coughs) Excuse me. The rich young man was blind to his idolatry. He didn't even see it until Jesus pointed it out. Jesus pointed it out to him and made him aware of it. And once the rich young man realized what his God was, he turned back to that God rather than turning to Jesus. What about us? What about us? How many times have we done this exact same thing? 
We live in a time where all of Scripture has been revealed to us. The story is complete and we know the drill. We know what God wants for us, from us. He has outlined it in His Word. He's outlined His expectations of us in the form of a book. And some of us were here at Sunday School this morning and we were studying from this book. We often think, oh, if I only knew what God wanted me to do with my life, then I would do it. If He would just reveal to me somehow exactly what He wanted me to do, I would certainly do it. And I'm here today to tell you that He's done this in our lives already. These things have been revealed to us. If you aren't doing what God has asked you to do, it's not that God hasn't revealed it to you yet. It's because you were un unwilling to do what He's asking of you. And I've conveniently got this list of 35 things that God is telling us, has told us, and will continue to tell us in His Word. And all of these things come from the Gospels. And I'm not going to reference where they come from as I read them, but know that they came directly from the mouth of Jesus. He says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. So He says, turn from your sin. Your sin is killing you, and the only thing that's going to save you is you coming to Me. He says, come and follow Me. Jesus says, rejoice when you're persecuted in My name. He says, let your light shine before all people. So as I'm reading these, think, God Himself has told me through His Word to do these things. He says, be reconciled to one another. That means when somebody wrongs you, confront them about it, and you, the two of you forgive each other. He says, take sin very seriously. He says, keep your word. He says, turn the other cheek. He says, love your enemies. He says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. He says, focus on spiritual disciplines for the right reason. A lot of us are studying a book called Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. Focus on spiritual disciplines for the right reasons. Seek God's kingdom first of all, he says. Do not worry about tomorrow. Does anybody struggle with that one? Tomorrow's Monday. Work is a coming. Use right judgment. Practice discretion. Ask, seek, and knock. Treat others as you would like to be treated. Choose the narrow path to life. Look out for false prophets. Pray for kingdom laborers. Be on your guard. Do not fear persecutors. Take my yoke upon you. Do not despise the little ones. Uh, he tells us how to deal with offenders. He tells us to practice forgiveness. He tells us to love God with all our heart, mind, and soul. He tells us to love our neighbor as ourselves. He tells us to stay alert and keep watch. He tells us to make disciples of all the nations. He tells us, and this is an important one, to deny ourselves. This is very uh, relevant for today's sermon. Deny yourself. He tells us to watch out for greed. That's another important lesson for today. Watch out for greed. He says to give to those who can't give anything in return. He tells us to be born again. We must be born again. And He tells us, this is number 35, if you love Me, you will keep My commandments. So, we, we like to think, well, if I just knew what God wanted out of my life, these are just 35 of many, many, many things and many ways that He wants us to live. So you might think, oh, I wish I knew what God wanted me to do with my life. Oh, I wish I knew how He wanted me to act. Oh, I wish He gave me some sort of directive to follow. I wish I had a better idea of who He was and how I should be. Well, there's no excuse because you have an entire book that tells you all of these things. And I'm, I'm included in this also. If you don't know who He is and what He wants of you, we, I'll include myself, we must not be spending time alone with Him. So if we go back to the list of the 35 commands from Jesus, if you do not understand what He wants from you, you must not be repenting of your sin. You must not be denying yourself. You must not be letting your light shine before others. You must not be keeping His commandments. You must not be staying alert and keeping watch. You must not be taking His yoke upon you. You must not be taking your sin very seriously. You must not be loving your enemies. You must not be forgiving people who have wronged you. And you must not be giving to people that have nothing to give in return. And if you aren't doing these things, you're not doing these things because you're not spending time alone with God in His Word. Because that's where He gives us these directives. And if we know that He's telling us to do these things and we're neglecting to do them, what are we doing? What, what, what are we doing? If you're not doing these things, you're probably not doing these things because you're not truly following Jesus. 
If you are following Jesus truly, you have repented of your sin, you have been born again, and you are actively listening to Him as He tells you how to live. I want to summarize this list of commands from Jesus very simply. To follow Jesus accurately, and I want to make this as simple as I possibly can, Jesus calls us to repent. To turn from our selfish sin and turn towards Him. The rich young man could not do that. He was unwilling to walk away from his wealth and his life. And my question for you is, what about you? To truly follow Jesus, you must deny yourself and take up your cross. The rich young man never got to this point. What about you? To truly follow Jesus, you must be born again. The rich young man was not born again. He rejected Jesus on sight to his face and kept to the path that he was on. What about you? And if you truly follow Jesus, you are, are a disciple. You are His disciple. And if you are His disciple, you are a follower of Jesus. If you are a follower of Jesus, He has given you a mission and a purpose. And that mission and purpose is to make other followers of Jesus. This starts in your home. From there, you will make disciples at work. From there, you will make disciples in other places that you frequent. The gym, the sauna. James got me a sign that says sauna. I found it in my office. I definitely didn't think it was James. I figured it was Bobby Scott or anybody other than James. But he got it on sale. Four dollars, and he probably expects me to repay him. But the joke's on him. I'm not going to do that. Thank you, James. I got a good laugh. It was worth four dollars. I'll pay back. So we can make disciples at the gym, the sauna, the grocery store. From there, Jesus welcomes you to go to the ends of the earth and make disciples. But, it must, but this discipleship must begin where you are right now. If you're not seeking to make disciples right where you are, there's no sense in flying across the world to do it. The rich young man never had, had the opportunity to make disciples because he was unwilling to become a disciple himself. There's such a pressure in this world to be successful. And our definition of success is often linked to our finances. Even if we don't link our view of success to our finances, we link our finances to our comfort. And I will be the first to admit, and I've noticed it's been a revelation in the last year that my biggest idol is comfort. I like the AC cold in the winter, and I like the heat hot in the summer. And when it's, when it's cold outside, I turn the heat on. When I'm hungry, I like to eat. When I'm thirsty, I like to drink, and nothing beats a shower after a long day. I prefer to have enough money in the bank uh, that money doesn't become a worry to me, and having money in the bank makes me very comfortable. Comfort is important to me, but I believe that comfort is the sneakiest idol of all because you don't often think about how comfortable your life is. You, you don't sit around and think, oh, to... I'm a little warm. I want to cool down. All I have to do is get up and push a button. That's how easy we have it. That, and we just sort of ignore, um, we kind of ignore how easy our life is. So when you're first saved, you, I say this all the time, when you're first saved, it's easy to see all the red flag sin in your life, the lust, the whatever it is. Um, but comfort is not the first thing that comes to your mind. But as you mature in your faith, you think, uh-oh, I've got a real issue with comfort, whether it be public speaking, or I don't want to go have that conversation with somebody at the gym because that's going to make me uncomfortable and it might make them uncomfortable. And I don't like uncomfortable because I like comfort. So I've noticed in my life, comfort is like a blanket of, uh, it covers a whole blanket of sin in my life. And uh, I'm glad that God pointed that out to me because now I'm working on it. But the rich young man was likely very comfortable with the things that he had. He had plenty of wealth. And money can take care of uh, many of our daily needs. It was likely that the rich young man didn't want to follow Jesus because in his eyes, all of his needs were accounted for. And if we read on in Mark chapter 10, Jesus gives a, gives, gives a word of wisdom to his disciples about people that idolize their wealth and comfort. Verse 23, And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. <clears throat> And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? 
Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but, with, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. So imagine that I have a needle in my hand. You wouldn't know the difference if I actually did because you wouldn't be able to see it. But in that needle, that needle is very small. At the top of that needle would be an eye that you could put a piece of thread through. Now imagine, and I tried to pick, who, who do I think could actually pull off bringing a camel into this building? Jimmy Walton was the first one that came to my mind. I don't know why. Sorry, Jimmy. But imagine Jimmy Walton walks in with a camel and we try to get that camel to go through the eye of this little bitty needle. Seems impossible. And that's the point Jesus is making. He says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, in my mind, I see it this way. It would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for people to walk away from the lives that they built for themselves than to follow Jesus in the ways in which He desires. So we, to my knowledge, we're all Americans here. Uh, we've built this sort of American dream here. And many of us are self-made people. We've pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps. We can get things done. And our bank accounts and our homes and our comfortable lives reflect that. And I know that we're not all rich. And some of us might even be struggling mightily uh, financially. But my point and Jesus' point in this story is that if you're putting anything ahead of Him, your focus is off. If you're more focused on your money than you're focused on Jesus, you will not inherit the kingdom of God, is what He's saying. If you're focused on your comfort more than you're focused on Jesus, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you're focused on your personal relationships more than you're focused on Jesus, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. He wants Him to be first. We read that over and over and over in the Bible. The rich young man was blinded by his wealth. He stated to Jesus how he hadn't killed anyone, he hadn't cheated, he hadn't lied, he even honored his father and mother. And Jesus points out the one major hitch in his step. And when Jesus points it out, the rich young man tucked his tail and went right back to his idol. So, if you remember, when I'm not going to reread the passage, but Jesus said, well, you, you missed one thing. And I want to ask you all today, what's your one thing? What's the thing that is holding you back from walking in full obedience and in full relationship with Jesus? It could be money. It could be comfort. It could be success. It could be your ego. It could be a relationship or several relationships. It could be sex. It could be drugs. It could be pride. It could be fear. It could be anxiety. Or it could be indifference and for me, for a long time, it was exactly that. It was indifference. I just simply didn't care one way or the other. Many things can hold us back from walking with Jesus. And to this, Jesus offers these words of wisdom. He says, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Him. I'm going to say that again. In all of these instances, whatever the thing is, the one thing that is in you that you choose to put before God, Jesus says, deny yourself. Take that thing away. Put that thing down. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow Him. If it's your wealth holding you back, deny yourself. If it's your comfort, deny yourself. If it's lust or drugs or ego or pride, deny yourself. All of these things only offer temporary satisfaction. You might be the wealthiest guy around, but when you die, your wealth is gone from you. It might pass to someone else, but it will satisfy you no longer. If drugs are your idol, you might feel moments of euphoria followed by a headache and nausea and loneliness. If sex is your idol, you might feel moments of pleasure followed by guilt, shame, isolation, or worse. None of these things are going to satisfy you in full. The only thing, the only person, the only God that can satisfy you is Jesus. Jesus offers you eternal life. He offers you forgiveness. He offers you the Holy Spirit. He offers you a heavenly home. He offers you answered prayers. He offers you love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness 
and gentleness and self-control. He offers you fruit, spiritual fruit. When you follow Him, you have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit produces fruit in your life. And Jesus offers you spiritual rewards once we arrive in heaven. And sometimes we get to see those rewards here on earth. Just like when somebody testifies and says, the Americans spent their time and their money and they use their words. And we're, we don't have special powers. We just listen to what God said. We knew a group of people were going to Australia. We look up and we said, oh, God calls us uh, to go to all the nations and make disciples. These people that I know are going there. I want in on that. That falls in line with God's will for my life. I'm going to say yes to this thing. And then you go do it. And then you see fruit. That is a spiritual reward. And there's many more coming in heaven. And this should be exciting to us. More exciting than our wealth, more exciting than our temporary pleasure. These things should be exciting to us. These are the things that Jesus is offering you. These are the same things that Jesus offered this rich young man. And the rich young man denied him and walked away disheartened. Now, here's the kicker. You have a choice. You can walk towards Jesus and accept his invitation to follow him and embrace this born again life. Or you can follow the God of wealth or comfort, and his name is Satan. He will leave you feeling disheartened and broken and empty forever. I have chosen, and many people in this room have chosen to follow Jesus, and this following of Jesus comes at a cost. I'm not always comfortable. I'm not comfortable right now. I drank too much coffee this morning. I feel like I could fall down. Getting up here and speaking is not uh, my happy place. I am not comfortable with it. Especially I'm noticing when I, I, thou shalt not take two week, two Sundays off ever again. Remind me of that next time I ask if I can do it, James. This following of Jesus comes at a cost. I constantly have to deny myself and my emotions and my feelings and my desires. I have to live for other people rather than myself. I make sacrifices that I didn't have to make before. My money is not mine, it's His. My life is not mine, it's His. Following Jesus comes at a cost. But the rewards are eternal life and forgiveness and the Holy Spirit and a heavenly home. And these things cannot be manufactured by the human hand. No matter how hard you try, no matter who you encounter, none of these things come from humanity. They only come from God. These are the rewards of the kingdom of God and these rewards are offered to the people of God when they walk in obedience with Jesus. So, with all that said, my advice today for anyone in here that doesn't have a relationship with Jesus, if you aren't in a relationship with Jesus, accept the invitation today. We see in this story, the rich young man, he says, hey, I am Jesus, I am God. Lay down your life. Lay down your money. Your money is your God. Give all your money away. And we see that the man says, I can't do that. And he walked away disheartened. I don't know the rest of the story for that fella. He could have turned it around at some point. God revealed to us in the book of Mark that he turned away from him. My assumption is he probably never, probably didn't reconcile that. I don't know. But we have the choice. We're all still breathing. You have the choice to follow Jesus. Don't turn away with a disheartened and prideful heart. Say yes to Jesus and begin walking with him in obedience right now in this moment. We're going to have a time of invitation. And the time of invitation for anybody that doesn't know is... A time where you sit and you reflect and you think to yourself, I'm not following Jesus. I see this illustration in this story. This is a real story of a man who said no to Jesus and he walked away disheartened. And the, the alternative to that is to accept the invitation of Jesus and get these rewards that he offers. Eternal life, relationship with him, spiritual fruit, a life that means something, a life that gives you a mission and a purpose for eternity. These are the things that Jesus is inviting us to, and the invitation is here for that and for your benefit. So really think about these things. And if it's not this week, if it's not right now in this moment, find me, call me, I'll meet with you. We can talk whenever you want about these things, and you can make that decision to follow Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the fruit that uh, we, we got to see through our, Amer our American, our Australian trip a few months ago, many months ago, many miles ago, many hours ago. 
Lord, I just I thank you for the Ballin family and what they're doing in Australia uh, to make disciples. And Steve said that if we're not if we're disciples that aren't making disciples, then we're not disciples. And that was the key takeaway for me for that trip. And Lord, I'm just grateful that we got to see disciples made uh, from our time there. And thank you for giving me the time in North Dakota with the with my friends and the Schnazi family. And I just pray that uh, Naomi is getting better. And I pray that anybody in here that doesn't have a personal relationship with you would make that change today and commit and submit their lives to you right now in this moment. I pray all of that in Jesus' name. Amen.